see all of you here. Um, it's really an honor to be here with all of you. And uh, so by way of introduction, my name is Jingying Yang. I'm a program lead at the Partnership on AI. I work on a project called About ML, which is on machine learning documentation and scaling that across a lot of different companies. The reason I'm really interested in organizational culture is because uh, when I started my career, I worked in management consulting and noticed that a lot of companies had a lot of organizational challenges, shall we say, and that was actually really impacting their profitability. Then I moved to the government to work on healthcare policy and noticed there as well how we organized really impacted what we could actually produce and how quickly we could get things done. And then working at Lyft uh, in a really cross-functional role, I really observed the chaos that comes with doubling every year in size. And I was surprised by how many times a thousand person company, the process was go talk to this one person. <laughs> And so it's been really interesting to be part of PAI and to be exploring these questions of how we can organize more effectively as an industry to enable all of the work that we here as a community really care about. Thanks, and uh, my name is Bogdana, and uh, I also wanted to share that it's been really great collaborating on this project in the last seven months together, and it really fits really nicely with the work that PAI is doing, but also a lot of the work that we see at the Fat Star Conference, and seeing the progression in the work within our community, I think it's even more critical to think about how do we take this to industry, and for me, this was really the inspiration of um, sort of why, why are we working on this together? And uh, I have a background in computer science and machine learning engineering uh, and almost a decade of working in industry in machine learning. For a long time, I debated whether I should go and do a PhD versus working in industry, but I ended up like, just really jumping and doing a lot of work first with a company that was making medical equipment and doing data analysis software for them, then with a company doing uh, software that went on manufacturing equipment, we were helping small and medium-sized um, equipment, manufacturing equipment providers, OEMs, to predict and prevent failures. Then later on with Samsung Research, where it was again manufacturing uh, sort of all kinds of hardware and sensors and utilizing machine learning on hardware. And then uh, really kind of thinking how do we take this Flat star perspectives into account when doing work in industry has, has been what I've been working on. Great. And unfortunately, some of our other collaborators on this work were unable to be here, but Ruman Chowdhury, who's the global responsible AI leader in Accenture, and also related to the study, we're working with Henry Kramer from Spotify. Thanks, Bobby. So I will give a brief overview of what we're going to do together in this room for 90 minutes. Uh, first, we're going to talk about the kind of landscape of where this tutorial fits into previous work, and then also give you a really brief rundown of the methodology and what a high-level overview of what we found. Then Bobby will take us on a brief tour of organizational science and also present our findings. That's the juiciest part, very exciting. And then we'll do a hands-on activity where you'll all divide into groups and we'll do a bit of a design thinking exercise. Uh, so, so why are we really here? Um, at a high level, the awareness of AI ethics has really been growing in the last many years <laughs> and probably thanks to many of the people in this room and the work that you all are doing. And I think as that has grown, we as an industry are realizing that it's a moment to actually think about how we move these AI ethics principles into practice. And this is really challenging. Across the board, I've never met anyone who said this was easy. This is very challenging. And it requires possibly a fundamental culture change. It requires us to really take practical steps to embed these ethics into how we do things at all levels. And so that begs the question, where are we going and how should we evolve our organizations to get there? So th our approach to these questions is uh, we observe two kind of major issues. 
One is that there's a big gap that exists between what academic research prioritizes, which is often technical problems, and what practitioners need, which is often about organizational challenges. And the second is that organizations often perceive a tension between doing the right thing and doing the profitable thing, even when that tension does not actually exist, which creates unnecessary hurdles for prioritizing Faramel projects. And our catalyzing observation is that organizations are actually very much differentially successful at doing Faramel work. So what does that mean? That leads us to a hypothesis that there are actually organizational structural elements that can enable or hinder Faramel work. And so our goal for this study is to find those enablers so that we can actually catalyze progress across the whole industry. And a brief moment to define what we mean by FairML. We mean really the work on fairness, accountability, and transparency of ML products and services. As you can see, if we didn't use the shorthand, our slides would not say much else. So that is why we're referring to it as FairML. But that really refers to all of the work in this kind of uh, area. So to situate our tutorial today, this definitely came from and is building off of a lot of previous work in this area, including some really highly relevant papers and also a previous Fat Star tutorial, which our collaborator Henriette uh, was leading, and then also decades of research in organizational science and other disciplines, as well as 25 original ethnographic interviews that we've conducted for this tutorial. And our goal for today's tutorial is to share what we've learned from those interviews, situate our results in the broader socio-technical and organizational science context, and then also highlight key insights that you could leverage for your organization. And where, where would all of this go? So in addition to the fact that we want to contribute to the growing body of practical knowledge by uh, writing all of this up into a paper that we can then share with everyone, we're also going to take some of these insights and use them to build out a how-to guide for how to scale documentation pilots uh, with our About ML project, which is a project that the Partnership on AI is leading. And our goal with that is to empower individual champions who want to advocate for change inside of organizations, starting with documentation, but very much uh, possibly expanding beyond that. So our methodology uh, at a high level was uh, we did semi-structured anonymized interviews, and our questions were designed in consultation with an industrial organizational psychologist. Participants could opt in or out of recording, and they Due to the sensitive nature of some of these questions, we do expect that we don't have complete information from everybody, even though they were so generous and already and shared so much of their time with us. We had 25 participants from 18 different or organizations across four continents, all actively involved in FARML work and across a variety of different departments and roles. Our interview questions really clustered into about four topics. Uh, three of them are really around what's happening today and how practices are already starting to shift a bit. So thinking about what their current role is like, uh, where the fair ML work came from, and then thinking about what exactly is the work and how it's situated organizationally. Also thinking about the current challenges and ethical tensions. And then the last one is really about what do we want to see in the future? So that's where we asked about what are the potential future structures that would better enable this type of work. And there are some summary statistics that we can share with you, which uh, are high level. Um, interviewees were situated in a really wide range of organizational structures. Uh, they were sometimes inside of cross-functional teams. Sometimes they were in a general AI team that didn't mention anything about ethics or responsible AI. Sometimes they were with an ethics review committee. And then um, at a high level, about one third of the efforts that our interviewees told us about started within the last year and two thirds actually prior to that. Um, people were actually about one-third doing this in their volunteering capacity, so in addition to their normal job, and then two-thirds actually had official roles related to this work. Um, and you can definitely read more into this online. But at a high level, what we realized is that there's a big gap between where we are today and where it could be better tomorrow. And where we are today is really that FairML is seen as a nice to have. That means that the work is ad hoc, it relies on volunteered time, it's pitted against business interests for priority and resources. And what could be better tomorrow is if FairML became an indispensable process. So it's indispensable in the sense that work is seen as crucial to business interests, and then as a process, it's integrated into all workflows with dedicated staffing 
and internal structures for education and scaling. So this is the gap that we have to bridge as a community and also with many other people beyond. And the question that we want to really explore today in our design exercise with you all is, how do we map this transition together? How do we bridge this gap? The framework that we'll be using is the two loops framework, and we will go into this at, with much more detail later, but just as a preview, it's a great way of thinking about how a dominant system slowly fades away while an emergent system comes to be. And with that, I will turn it over to Bobby. Thank you. Great. So in the next session now, so first, why do we focus on organizational structure in the first place? I'm sure many of you have heard of Conway's law and uh, he framed that organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. And um, many of us may have ex direct experience with, with that, but um, what Harvard Business School did recently was that they framed this uh, concept as the mirroring hypothesis and they drew from literature on organizational design and organizations as complex systems, as, as well as literature on product design and product development. And they did a review of 142 empirical studies that tried to analyze how does this mirroring hypothesis hold in practice? What are some exceptions and what does it really look in, in practice? And um, they, even though they did the review in 2016, actually none of those companies, the 142 companies, many of them were software companies, but none of them seemed to be developing AI systems or products. So from theoretical perspective, it's interesting considering the supply chain of AI enabled products and systems to, to think about whether this really applies or how does it apply? What are some exceptions? What does it look like? But ultimately, we wanted to ask the question of what organizational structure could enable positive outcomes in the work on fairness, accountability, and transparency of AI. Um, this was also studied, the same concept of Conway's law was also studied in organizational science. Um, decades of work from organizational theorists of Wander or Likowski looked into that, and she called it the duality of technology in organizations where she sees technology that is physically constructed by actors working in a certain social context. And then uh, si similarly, technology is socially constructed by the way actors give meaning um, to technology through their interactions with it. So when humans act in organizations, she writes, they create and recreate three fundamental elements of social interaction, meaning, power, and norms. And we see that constantly in the day-to-day -day work of industry practitioners. Um, she developed the structurational model of technology that you see on the slide, and it's um, building on Anthony Giddens' structurational theory. And it has three major components, human agents that are the technology designers, decision makers, the users, um, as well as the users of the technology. Then we have the technology as the material artifacts mediating task execution. And then we have the institutional properties of the organizations, which includes business strategies, control mechanisms, ideologies, cultures, division of labor, um, as well as external factors, such as governmental regulation, competitive forces, um, outside pressures, such as um, vendor strategies, supply chain management, norms, and other socioeconomic conditions. So this brings us to our focus in this study. We wanted to investigate the reciprocal interaction of human actors and structural features of organizations, recognizing that human actions are enabled and constrained by structures which are, the same, which are themselves the product of previous actions. To situate our work in this broader context, we will briefly look at three kinds of organizational systems which have evolved in the past uh, 40 years, summarized by organizational theorist Richard Scott in what he called the rational, natural, and open organizational system. Then we briefly look at how human agents organize through building networks, communities of practice, and systems of influence throughout the so-called life cycle of emergence. 
And lastly, all of these frameworks have informed our structure of the study as well as the thematic analysis of the results into forming this uh, different transitions, as Jinyang was ex talking, into what we call a dominant, emergent, and aspirational future state of the interconnection between organizational properties, the organizational structure, and the work practices of human actors within those organizations, as well as outside of them. Okay, we start by summarizing some decades of organizational science research where scholars develop the notion of rational, natural, and open organizational structures. So the rational organizational uh, organization is um, the easiest way to think about it is if you think of assembly line manufacturing facility, and the way people are tightly coupled to tasks specified by pre-designed workflow processes. The metaphor that organizational scientists have been using is that of the machine, where people are seen as extension of the machine. Then the natural organization signified a radical shift in organizational ideology no longer were people seen as mere appendages of the machines because people and only people could learn. The concept of the learning organization was developed and the metaphor became that of the organization as an organism. And as an organism, the goal was to grow, learn and develop. There was a big focus on employee um, um, reskilling and helping people learn new skills and this helps the organizations grow, learn and develop. Similarly to an organism, there was this tension between an exterior and an interior boundary. So the organization and society at large, there was this boundary between them. And as a consequence, there was this notion of sort of a survival ideology. And um, inevitably what happened was that the exterior environment of the organization begins to be seen as a threat against which the organism must adapt to survive. For example, through intellectual property or other strategies that company do to compete between each other and sort of protect themselves. Um, it wasn't until the mid nineties that it was possible to move away from such natural closed organizational models and towards open organizations. Um, in open organizations take a lot of um, inspiration from open systems theory and the central insight emerging from open systems thinking is that all organizations are incomplete and depend on exchanges with other systems. The metaphor became that of an ecology. And uh, the notion of environment as a threat was replaced by the realization that environmental features are conditions for the survival of the organization. Open systems are characterized by interdependent flows of information, interdependent activities performed by coalitions, uh, partnerships of teams solving problems in complex environments. How do human agents organize? We explore that through the lens of the life cycle of emergence. Emergence is the fundamental scientific explanation for how local changes can materialize as global systems of influence. Systems thinking scholar Margaret Whitley calls emergence the only way change happens. And together with, a uh, with an organization she co-founded called the Barkana Institute, they have been experimenting with new organizational forms uh, based on a coherent theory of how living systems organize, adapt, and change. In nature, change never happens as a result of top-down preconceived strategic plans or from the mandate of any single individual or boss. Um, change begins as local actions spring up simultaneously in many different areas. And if they are men disconnected, nothing ever happens. However, if they connect together and form, form these communities of practice, they become stronger together and have the potential to become a system of influence and shift norms. The life cycle of emergence starts with networks. They are a result from self-organization, where individuals can move in and out fluidly based on how much they personally benefit from participating. Through the network uh, system, individuals find other people who are interested in the same field, they find collaborators, they realize the value of being in a relationship. 
through forming these so-called communities of practice, they uh, intentionally create new knowledge for their field of practice and make commitments and participate for their own benefit. Not for their own benefit, but to serve the needs of others. This is how systems of influence emerge, where pioneers, um, pioneering efforts become the norm. We wanted to see if we could use this framework as an organizing principle for the work within the Fast Start community of practice. The way we imagined doing that was through the two-loop theory of change model developed by the Berkana Institute and further explored by Cassie Robinson, who sadly couldn't be here today. Um, in essence, it shows a dominant system that is dying and an emerging system that has the potential to become the system of influence. As the dominant system is reaching its peak, new pioneers emerge, recognizing that the dominant system is in decline. It's important that this new emergent sy system is named and that the pioneers are um, people and organizations building alternatives are connected together and the work they're doing illuminated. Through this, they form communities of practice and grow more coherence as a field. And as they do that, they um, create an environment that welcomes other people and organizations to join. So you can think of the dominant system as um, an example, peak oil and the emergent one as renewable energy resources. Then the pioneering efforts will be um, developments in terms of wind, solar technology, as well as non-technical solutions that will contribute to transitioning towards using renewable energy resources, right? Because the peak oil dominant system is declining. Um, then it helps when there are people in the dominant system who do work to protect and enable those alternatives as they are emerging, whether through funding, new policies, or other strategies, they're holding space for the pioneers to do their work. Others work to help people and organizations transition from the existing dominant model, and there's a need for people who help keep the dominant system stable as it's dying, right? Because this is important because there's so many people and so much that depends on the dominant system that that transition is not something that can happen overnight. Um, in our case, the dominant system we looked at was fair machine learning as a nice to have. And then the emergent system, which we see as that aspirational future we are moving towards, uh, is fair machine learning as an indispensable process that is deeply integrated in all organizational processes. So this systems thinking framework has helped us place ourselves in the, and the interviewees in our study in the broader context of the dominant organizational mindset within which we are operating. Um, four teams emerged from our conversations with practitioners and all of them were patterns transitioning towards this aspirational future state of uh, fair machine learning work. Um, we explicitly asked partic practitioners about what is the, their vision for the aspirational future state. For example, in our study, we had the question, what is your vision for the future state? What do you need to change to get to that state? What do you need to retire from the current mindset? and what can be salvaged or repurposed from our current mindset. Then the dominant and emerging state you see here were the teams that directly emerged from the data given what our practitioners doing in their day-to-day. Their -day. So now we'll talk through each of these teams and I'll be using my note. Okay. Um, so first, we notice that organizations most often act only when pushed by external forces, right? This was most common in our data. And uh, the most common incentive for change were catastrophic media attention, um, decreasing media tolerance, and um, I'm sure like every day almost there's something happening in media that is influencing how um, organizations are making decisions. Um, then also fair machine learning work is often perceived as a taboo topic and the question of whose job is this comes up in meetings. Um, fair ML work is most often not compensated and completely voluntary. 
Um, in several cases, the formation of a fair amount team was catalyzed by the plus one work of uh, on investigating potential bias issues of a model the company was about to deploy. Then fair amount work is often perceived as complicated. There are too many steps involved and it's challenging for um, how, how do we communicate? What are the steps involved? What we saw in this emerging sort of proactive state was that organizations um, are setting up fair amount evaluation and investigation processes. There's um, support and oversight from legal teams. They're collaborating with policy teams. They're setting up standardized review processes. Um, in, in some of the organizations we talked to, fair machine learning work was um, acknowledged and compensated. Grassroots actions have made it a company-wide priority through the internal advocacy efforts of a few people who've been proactive champions for the work. A lot of our interviewees talked at length about the advocacy, advocacy actions they've um, done internally at the organizations. Um, participants also reported proactively using various internal communication strategies, such as taking screenshots of problematic algorithmic outcomes and using that as a way to communicate. <laughs> Uh, then also inviting teams to do an hour long lunch hour presentation and talk through the problems they've encountered, including product teams as well as research teams and policy and legal teams. So having really interdisciplinary internal discussions was something that's happening more and more in industry. What participants talked about that they would want to see in the anticipatory future state is that organizations have clear and transparent communication channels internally and externally. So internally, there has been already a growing number of educational initiatives, onboarding and upskilling employees through internal faster related educational curriculum, but also educating our customers on how to use our product, what are the potential unintended consequences, what are potential for misuse, and then having this in, in um, when sales happens, like all the stages of the product life cycle, having this educational component integrated in that. Then also participants talked about the need for technical and non-technical tools that orchestrate fair ML evaluations, again, both internally and externally. So for customers utilizing the produced algorithmic models in different contexts, how are we um, keeping track of those fair ML concerns? And then they express the concern, should we even engage with clients without um, their use of these fair ML tools? Um, what happens if they don't agree to use those, these tools in production? And this, again, needs to be an organization-wide conversation. Organization uh, level com organizational level conversations about Fairmail dominated were dominated by ill-informed performance trade-offs many times, and a lot of the majority of practitioners talked about the lack of metrics, and um, they were not sure how to measure impact. Quantifying what we do is really difficult in the qualitative space. Um, often they need to distill what they're doing to number of clicks and other measurable metrics that are really not representative of fair ML issues. They reported the use of inappropriate metrics, um, such as those sort of number of quicks, clicks and user engagement metrics. Um, they express that academic metrics are very different than industry metrics. For example, user engagement and positive user experience is often not a metric easily utilized by researchers. So there's again sort of gap between research and um, industry where we need to evolve metrics that, that are cl come closer to what people need in industry. Uh, people talked about the lack of awareness of, about the work and potential risks. Many participants reported being measured on generating avenue, revenue and delivering work. And in some cases, they've used that as an enabling argument that mitigating fair mail risks prior to launch is a lot cheaper than once you've launched something and it goes sideways. Also, practitioners talked about the need to communicate the lack of metrics to their clients. Um, and again, sort of uh, throughout the sales pipeline, needing to have that level of understanding between the 
um, organization and their clients who are utilizing their models. Even when they're using accuracy-based indicators, what are the sort of indicators they're using in terms of explainability, interpretability, bias, and others? In the emergent state, we saw that m many of the organizations we talked to have set up frameworks and processes that evaluate fair ML projects. Uh, they've moved away from ethics washing and they've utilized metrics that accommodate for diverse and long-term goals, acknowledging that there's no long hanging fruit and many of these problems we're dealing with need a lot of research. Um, they reward efforts focused on internal organizational education and um, have created enabling collaborations, um, say, working with external groups and experts in the field to first help define benchmarks prior to deploying and then make sure that everything is performing as it should be after deployment. They also reward the culture of risk taking for the public good through internal investigations of potential fair ML issues. And that's no longer seen as a plus one work, but it's part of what they're doing in their day job. In the future state, perform, um, participants reported um, that organizations could redefine what impact looks like. So the concrete results need to be defined in a way that includes societal impact through data-driven efforts. Um, that includes having uh, qualitative frameworks that are deployed and um, these qualitative methods together with existing evaluation metrics are capture fair amount concerns. Uh, we have improved alignment between how and what we teach in academic institution and what is needed in practice. And um, lastly, organizational structures exist, enabling practitioners to more closely collaborate with marginalized communities where, le where legal and other considerations are taken into account. Okay. Most commonly, participants reported that um, in some cases, the organizations has very obscure roles and there is latent uncertainty about role definitions and responsibilities for fair amount work. For example, several participants expressed that they needed to be a senior person in their organization in order to make their concerns heard. Um, reputational risk is still the biggest incentive for this line of work and practitioners would use it as a leverage point. One interviewee mentioned that if they can't make a legal argument about their concerns, their biggest argument would be, what if ProPublica found out? <laughs> That's a good argument. Then <laughs> practitioners talked about the need for negotiating between products and research team and having this sort of negotiation be formalized instead of only relying on personal uh, trust relationships between people. Um, in the emerging state, we saw uh, that there is scaffolding to support firmer works, firmer work on top of existing internal structures. Many of the interviewees have had the ability to craft their own role in a dynamic way, informed by both internal and external factors. So we saw that a lot of times people had a clearly defined role that they would craft themselves, and uh, otherwise people were mostly doing that as a plus one. So if the organization gives them more ability to craft their roles, they had huge impact on the kind of work they are doing. So clear roles and responsibilities and feedback loops help practitioners to craft a role that better suits internal and external factors. Um, accountability is distributed across organizational structures. Practitioners talked about uh, how in their organization issues get confidently escalated to management. Um, they talked about being privileged in having a research group that is focused on these issues and that otherwise they wouldn't be as cognizant as they are. Um, in some cases, accountability was distributed across product lifecycle and across people and groups. It was part of a workflow and uh, teams were held accountable to what they've committed to. So if they've defined a fat star goal, then they're accountable to accomplishing that. Many times we saw um, teams focusing on documentation and algorithmic review processes and um, interdisciplinary groups, interdisciplinary um, discussions in the review process and documentation process. And this was practitioners reported like this having like huge impact on their work. 
Um, also, in terms of organizational structures, some organizations had set up internal review boards, publication and release norms, also new kinds of fair machine learning roles, such as cross group champions, uh, including research champions who are getting involved in collaborating with policy team, legal teams and others, but also product related responsible AI champions, such that responsible AI champions looking across product groups and spreading awareness. In one case, for example, a researcher was embedded um, in product team for a certain amount of time, and they do that in different product teams and help them with fair ML issues. Um, one participant expressed their concern that currently we have a bandage kind of solution, and there, that's something that sort of comes at the end, but there needs to be a bigger organizational and structural change rather than just adding a process at the end. Lastly, participants reported being increasingly cognizant of external drivers for change, such as cities and governments participating to create responsible AI centers of excellence. And that again could be an enabler for their organization to consider these concerns seriously. In the future state, participants talked about fair machine learning responsibilities being integrated throughout all business processes related to the work of product teams. Fair machine learning reviews are, and reports are required before release. They've become a requirement for new features. They're more or less part of the code review for software. Um, one participant suggested that as you're creating the product, maybe there's a part of the product that you create that helps you assess the fairness and mitigate responsible AI issues. Um, Participants talked about um, having an organizational culture that supports interdisciplinary work and is able to quantify the value of um, interdisciplinary work. Um, the participants talked about having new kinds of roles and instituting fairness and audit teams. And that needs, that needs to be an AI operations kind of role. Right now, it falls often uh, under machine learning engineering, but it doesn't seem like it's the right place for it. One participant talked about how machine learning engineers should be allowed to be more creative and experiment, but you still need people to be monitoring and auditing the old, already deployed models. Um, Participants talked about the need for allowing for an enabling external critical scrutiny, as we're seeing a lot at this year's FATS conference, then achieving scale through partnership-based and multi-stakeholder frameworks. So public shaming of high-stakes AI failures could help <coughs> enable um, us to move towards the building of shared industry benchmarks. And industry standards, many practitioners talked about the need for industry standards, industry-wide distributed accountability, protocols, um, best practices. Okay, and our last, this sort of pattern of this um, transition to that future state goes from this sort of fragmented current state towards a more aligned future state of fair machine learning work in industry. So people most dominantly talked about misalignment between individual, team, and organizational level incentives and mission statements. Many times the spread of information relies on individuals' relationships, how they communicate their trust relationships and ability to navigate multiple levels of hierarchy and multiple stakeholders. They often describe the organization having an obscured organizational structure they talked about the difficulty when algorithmic impacts are often diffuse or hard to identify. Then the lack of data for sensitive, sensitive groups to help with the evaluation and testing. Also, oftentimes companies would collect data internally, however, that's extremely biased. Um, in the emerging state, we saw that many organizations are making steps towards organizational structures that enable uh, teams to focus their efforts on fair male issues. However, overly rigid organizational incentives can de demotivate addressing ethical tensions. For example, part of the work of fair male participants um, is conflict resolution, managing conflicts between different people, teams, and priorities. And this often participants express that leads to stress and burnout. 
Uh, people were often incentivized to produce complex solutions to problems. The uh, complexity is incentivized whether or not it's needed. And that is something that is part of the performance evaluation process, but obscure metrics only make the fair amount challenges more difficult. Participants talked about their organizational inertia and competing priorities make it challenging to justify certain research agendas. Moreover, industry-specific product-related problems may not have sufficient research merit or more specifically an ability for the researcher to publish. Sometimes because of privacy reasons, data used in the research experiments may not allow researchers to, recognize, to be recognized for their work. Uh, translating high level values down to the last mile, this is something that we saw emerging and there is a huge need for leadership to get involved. And this is what we saw in the aligned future aspirational state where organizational leadership understands, supports, and is deeply engaged with the fair amount concerns. Culture needs to change, participants said. Um, we need to let go of the fear of being scrutinized Organizational functions um, need to act fluently. Every single person understands risks. Collectively, as teams, we understand risks. And also, we have leaders who talk about risks publicly and admit when mistakes happen. Uh, FAIR ML needs to be prioritized at the high level organizational mission, as well as translated into actionable goals down to the individual level through established processes. So again, these were the preliminary results of the transitions or patterns that we found in the data. And um, it's been really fascinating having such amazing contributors to this project already. And we continue working on it within the About the Mail framework. And really having this workshop together helps us frame this perspective and discuss them together as a community. So in the second portion of um, our time together today, we hope to do that through um, um, an activity that uses this two-loop theory of change model to help us think through um, what are the working practices that some of which we discussed already as a results from our study, but some of which I'm sure you're doing in your day-to-day -day and you've been facing in your day-to-day. And then on one side, we have these work practices. On the other side, organizational structures and organizational properties, and thinking about what are those enablers that could help us transition. So the dominant system, right, is going to be the one that we're going to give away some scenarios. And uh, we're going to see a description of a scenario that is sort of the dominant system you're, the, that defines the contest we're working within. And it has this sort of fair machine learning as a nice to have um, context where the aspirational future state is where we're heading towards. So really, if we had the opportunity to redefine the operating model of that organization describing a scenario, uh, what could that look like? And how, how do we do that? That makes it such that fair machine learning is an indispensable integrated process throughout the whole organization we're working with in each of those scenarios. And I'll hand it back to Jinya. Great. Thanks, Bobby. That was so fascinating and exciting. And I hope you all are excited to take some of these things that we've just heard and uh, put them into practice. So uh, we invite you all to gather yourselves into groups of four or five around these posters where we will be leading you through a bit of an activity. Um, we're gonna start a five minute timer and invite you to gather yourselves into your groups, introduce yourselves to each other, and then um, read the scenario that you'll be working on. And then also write an organizational name for your own team, just you know whatever team name, come up with a team name, write it on your poster. <laughs> and then at the very end of this whole 45 minute exercise, we're gonna ask one person to share something from your group. So start thinking about that as well. So go uh, gather around a poster, um, form your little groups, and then we'll be around to hand you some s school supplies. Uh, we ended up, real quick, uh, so we ended up with what we thought was actually kind of a problematic use case uh, from the onset. We ended up with, uh, what is the name of our company? 
Uh, Empty Frisk, they're essentially uh, North Point. They're a company trying to do pretrial risk assessments. Um, and so we identified a lot of things internally that they could do, but one of the main things I think we came up with is sort of looking at the use case from a start and deciding if maybe you should be doing that in the first place and interacting with the communities on that point. <laughs> Great. Okay. Maybe don't do the thing you're going to plan to do. Great insight. Um, next group. Um, so we're talking about this company called Feed Mirror, which is in the, I guess, dominant stage uh, of Fair ML. Um, and their employees are raising lots of concerns, uh, but there's no kind of like organizational-wide incentives uh, to turn that into Fair ML, Fair ML program. Um, so one of the insights we had was that one way for the concerns, employee concerns, to be um, to feed back into organizational changes, if there was a regular town hall of leadership, uh, for where employees could surface concerns that could be then like they could be used to influence the core values of the organization and therefore like um, incentivize leadership to do something about fair ML. Awesome. Town halls as a mechanism for more employee engagement on these issues. And just as a, a note, everyone actually has pretty much the same scenario, just different companies. So you do not have to summarize your scenario. You all kind of know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So um, here, uh, one of the ways that we said uh, it's possible to embed a culture of responsible AI or ethical AI in a company is to put in place a governance board uh, with uh, internal and external communication with uh, ethicists and lawyers who have uh, sort of veto right or are assigned the task to validate the use of AI. Or, yeah. Great. A multidisciplinary expert led review board with veto, with veto rights. That's, that's great. Thank you. Uh, from the very beginning, we agreed on the fact that uh, before trying to identify the best ML practices, we need to identify whether the problem can be solved with ML practices. Uh, so, uh, and if the answer to this question is yes, then we need to regard whether we need to discuss structural reforms in the organizations before moving into technicalities. So we believe that uh, the, uh, our discussion needs to begin with the protection of the employees in the unionization mm -hmm. and the protection of the whistleblowers uh, before even start discussing uh, what can be done in terms of uh, the uh, machine learning practices. Okay, great. Stronger protections for employees, possibly uh, unionization and protections for whistleblowers. <laughs> great, thank you. Uh, next group is somewhere over here. So we thought that this organization was at such a like baby, like right at the beginning of the process, just with some people expressing concerns over and over, so that the first step would be a meeting between those people who are expressing those concerns and leadership to get the process started, and then perhaps talk about how to clarify the organization's mission with the employee's mission. Great. <laughs> Great. So uh, I, I missed that one because I was distracted by this. <laughs> Just first step, getting leadership and the, the people who are bringing this up over and over to actually meet. Mm. Connecting leadership and the employees, bridging that gap. Thank you. Uh, next group. Ours was a little uh, messy, but the one thing that had the most blue arrows to other things um, and the only sort of positive feedback loop was um, hiring for skills in fair ML. And you can ignore how self-serving that suggestion is. <laughs> <laughs> hiring for skills in fair ML, awesome. And you got a whole feedback loop. This is very exciting. This is very, very exciting. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, so we, we had a number of suggestions, and we only really got to connect some of them. Um, one of the things that came out was really the separation between kind of internal and external evaluation and communications. Um, and we think while certainly, you know, bringing internal thoughts externally, it's great for transparency of these companies. There might be some thoughts on how staying internal allows for more honesty and more kind of pers pursuit of these things. Great, so starting perhaps with the internal stuff so that they can pursue these in earnest. Or understand, the 
understanding the balance between internal and external. Great. Thank you. Um, we were also kind of similarly, so our, our situation, the employees, they had like a personal ethical um, commitment, but the management wasn't meeting it. So we were thinking about um, internal and external commitments and also having metrics that would feed back into the design. Um, and like different, different sort of like levels of organization would care about like different metrics. So, and th they, they would have to be independent. Um, those were kind of the things that, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, and then we also said that that's true. Like, while people do have sort of like personal um, aspirations, they're not being really incentivized or rewarded from the management or the company to care about fairness, um, which is probably really necessary. And that could also be tied into um, sort of defining the goal of, of, of the problem and the product when you're defining it, that you want these metrics um, to be. Great, sounds like a uh, better metric definition and also pretty much a lot of the stuff that we have talked about. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, we were talking similarly about metrics, but having those metrics come through from a change in investment strategy and the board composition. So having uh, the board set metrics or value metrics that are more sustainable and uh, I learned through this discussion about zebras unite, which is essentially the opposite of a unicorn, if you're not familiar with it, so more sustainable that way. <laughs> awesome, uh, can't wait to look up zebras unite and uh, board, board driven and investment driven metrics. Uh, very interesting. Hi, uh, thanks. So we were also kind of brainstorming various kind of practices that uh, companies could employ, a lot of them similar to the ideas that came up here today. Uh, so the one uh, insight that we wanted to share is that actually they're all kind of self-reinforcing because once a company, you know, or a group of people starts to care about fairness issues, it's kind of gonna snowball. Um, but uh, there are also tensions that we should notice and the one tension that we were kind of discussing is a tension between having a dedicated team uh, for accountability and having, uh, you know, giving responsibilities to employees. Uh, so on the one hand, uh, uh, if you, if you, yeah, how, I mean, how do you start? If you start by giving responsibilities to all the employees, then it's no one's responsibility. Uh, but on the other hand, if you start with a dedicated team, then, you know, now it's also no one's, no one's responsibility because, like, you know, it's not my job. Um, so we thought this was a pension worth thinking about in some way. Great, so one is everything is a self-reinforcing loop, so that's good, and then two is a chicken and egg problem for maybe how to get started in terms of having employees versus, uh, you know, not having them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, some of the, uh, the other groups, uh, we were dealing with the issue of should we even build it? Um, and so with that, sort of the crux of the problem becomes somewhat of an existential one. So any of the measures we do kind of risk the company just having to either like dissolve. And so that sort of led us to think that we really need to be relying on external measures. So uh, implementing external um, independent auditors and ethics committees or um, guardrails that can help prevent this. Um, and if we're still gonna continue, then we need to be either framing you need to be figuring out ways to frame and minimize the negative impact and just try and do as least harm as we can or uh, look into investing into new innovative ways to capitalize in a, in a new business venture, maybe similar space, but actually work in like an ethical business model rather than an ethical one. Great, thank you so much. Um, thanks all for all of your really fascinating ideas. Um, we hope you found this session as much fun as we did. We're so, so gratified and honored to be here uh, sharing all of this with you. And we're really grateful for all of your active and enthusiastic participation. So uh, a few things before we leave. One is we would love to digitize these graphs that you all have created. If you are open to it, um, please discuss it with your group. And if anyone is not open to it, um, feel free to like draw a big X through it and we will not digitize that one. 
but the ones that uh, you give us permission to digitize, we will email out to you all if you are interested. Um, we do not have a form to collect your email addresses, so send us an email, me and Bobby, and we will add you to that list. Uh, also send us an email if you are interested in collaborating on this, if your organization is interested in getting involved. And then um, finally, on Wednesday night, we are having a happy hour hosted by the Partnership on AI. It will be an interactive happy hour in the plenary room. We'll be talking about, about ML as a project and also some of the FTA-related work that PAI is doing. We're going to be working more on uh, what documentation questions can enable various different uh, ethical concerns, so it's the other side of the About ML project to this one, which is more focused on the organizational stuff. And uh, we want to really thank our collaborators, Henriette Creamer and Ruman Chowdhury, who could not be here today. And a really big thanks to Bobby for kicking off all of this work and being really the driving force behind all of this research. So can we give Bobby a big round of applause? <laughs> Thanks, thanks everyone. This is this is ever taken, and we'd love to collaborate with you more on this in this field. Thank you, Junior. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, sorry, you didn't say what time the happy hour was. Oh, I did not say what time the happy hour was. It is at 7 p.m. on Wednesday. <laughs>